hockey fans, welcome to the Across the Pond Hockey Podcast YouTube channel. If it's your first time here and you'd like to support us, please hit that subscribe button and that like button. It goes a long way in helping us develop the program. Before we get to tonight's episode, I have to take a minute to thank our wonderful sponsors, starting with the China Hockey Group. The China Hockey Group is a family-oriented group of ice hockey leagues, training programs, and community initiatives geared towards developing hockey in Southeast Asia. From their incredible Junior Tigers program all the way up to the CIHL, which is Hong Kong's elite full-contact ice hockey league, they have a program suitable for players of all ages and abilities. You can also stop by the Warrior Bauer Hockey Shop in Central for all your equipment needs and skate sharpening. Check out their website for more information at ChinaHockeyGroup.com. That's ChinaHockeyGroup.com. Next, we have our friends at Accessory House Global. If you're like me and your headphones look like this, it's time to head to AccessoryHouseGlobal.com for any accessories you need for your headphones. From cables to carrying cases to new ear pads, they carry products for all the biggest brands. Head to their website at AccessoryHouseGlobal.com. Use the promo code ATP20 for 20% off your purchase. That's AccessoryHouseGlobal.com. Next, we have our pals over at Wheel Hub Asia. These guys are committed to building community and bringing accessibility to inline hockey players across Southeast Asia. They're heading into the year two of Hong Kong's newest inline league, Three Inline. You can head to their website for all of your inline hockey needs at wheelhubasia.com. Enter discount code ATP10 for 10% off your purchase. That's wheelhubasia.com. Next, we have our friends at Yardley Brothers Craft Brewery. Folks, if you're a craft brew fan and you're in Hong Kong, then you absolutely have to check out Yardley Brothers' incredible selection of award-winning brews. You can head to the Beer Shack on Lama Island or the Yardley Brothers Cafe and Bistro at 62 Peel Street in Central. If you can't get out of the house, no problem. Just head to their website, yardleybrothers.hk, and you can get their delicious products delivered right to your door. That's yardleybrothers.hk. Last but not least, a huge thank you to Mr. Paul McLean at Sunset Studio in Kennedy Town for always making the podcast sound great. If you're looking for a place to jam with your band or record a new song, check them out on Instagram at sunset underscore studio underscore HK. That's sunset underscore studio underscore HK. Folks, the websites at description will be in the description all the discount codes will be there for you please check them out and support our wonderful sponsors hey hockey fans welcome to across the pond hockey talks volume 56 my very special guest today is from the great canadian hockey town of sarnia ontario he holds the record for most games officiated in the nhl at 2165 including 12 stanley cup finals He's worked at the Olympics, World Cups, All-Star Games, Winter Classics, and everything in between. He's also an analyst, broadcaster, author, husband, father, grandfather, and just so happens to be one of my hockey heroes. Please welcome to Across the Pond Hockey Talks, the incomparable Carrie Frazier. Carrie, welcome to the show. I am honored to be with you. It's uh, it's certainly, uh, you know, like I, I just said, mentioned to you before we started recording, and you, you made the point really clear. The hockey world is a very small world. Connections are made, as we can see all over the world. Here I am in Hong Kong. And you are right now, where are you actually? I'm in uh, our uh, home base, uh, which is Marlton, New Jersey, near okay. Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, I relocated uh, my family down here from Sarnia, Ontario, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, our hometown and a hockey hotbed and uh, we uh, moved down here in 1988 uh, i was uh, the second nhl referee to relocate into the united states most of our guys uh, at that time were living in canada and primarily around the toronto area uh, so the league was looking to uh, move some people uh, weather was always an issue in the winter time uh, certainly for travel and uh, the more that we could spread people out uh, from a home base perspective, uh, the rule of thumb was that you needed to live within 100 miles of an NHL city yeah. back then. And the Philadelphia Flyers marketplace 
had the most teams. If you drew a compass around uh, Philly with a 150 mile radius, there were so many teams that I could uh, drive to and come home at night, be in my own bed after the game, even though I would work as many games in Los Angeles or Vancouver and all the other cities as much as I would in the Philadelphia marketplace. Well, Kerry, your love for the game of hockey is infectious. I mean, every time I see you talk about the game, you can see your face light up. Um, so take me really take me back to your childhood and, and your introduction to the game and your, your uh, childhood in, in Sarnia. Oh, my gosh. I, I started, uh, my dad was playing professional hockey at the time. He was uh, playing in the International Hockey League and, and Senior A, the original six teams. Uh, you know, it was difficult for for uh, players of uh, less than NHL level skill uh, to crack that market. Uh, Dad um, was a very avid sportsman. Uh, He actually went over to Scotland in 1947. Uh, They were all Canadian players, played in the Scottish International Hockey League. Um, They had a tryout at Maple Leaf Gardens. Dad made the league. And uh, they went over on a ship and he lived there for a year and and played in uh, Falkirk. Um, Came back home, met my mom in Sarnia and and, uh, they married and and had me. Dad was playing pro. Uh, I can remember as far back as being able to walk. um, I had a hockey stick in my hand and I would slap a puck. Um, We uh, we lived with uh, my great grandfather. We cared for him and uh, he was uh, rather feeble, but he had a cane and he played the goalie. Uh, sitting in a chair, and I would be uh, slapping the puck. I learned to skate uh, when I was 15 months old, 15 yeah. months. Uh, I would go to dad's hockey practices. The trainer would put my little skates on. I'd go out, uh, uh, starting out pushing a chair around and then holding onto a hockey stick. And these big, ugly hockey players that frightened me with no teeth would be skating towards me, and I'd just keep slapping pucks at yeah. them to keep them at bay. Um, so uh, I became a good little hockey player. Um, Sarnia is a very competitive hockey market. Yeah. Uh, several NHL, many NHL players uh, have graduated from there. As a matter of fact, I played AAA midget. We won all Ontario championships. My dad coached the team. We had five players off that team who wanted to play in the NHL. One of them, Wayne Merrick, won four Stanley Cups. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, my dad was not only a, a very tough professional player you would call him a goon back then he was also a boxer and he taught me to fight when I was 12 years old fighting was part of the game at that time Uh, not so much now in the NHL as we see Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, especially it's a it's a big man's game and I was a little man trying to compete in a big man's game so when I played three years at AAA midget for dad uh, he had already taught me how to take care of myself Um, I didn't like bullies and uh, there were times when he would tap me on the shoulder and say, I need you to go out there and teach that guy a lesson is how he put it. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds like a lot of old school hockey dads to me. <laughs> it certainly was. I, yeah. uh, I, I had to, uh, we were playing uh, in a midget tournament over in Port here in Michigan across the river. And uh, we were in the final game. Uh, I would have been about 14, 15 at the time. I was 115 pounds and five foot nothing. Yeah. And we had uh, this big, big team with guys that went on to the NHL. And we were in the final game and uh, there was a real dirty guy on the uh, on the Michigan team uh, that we were playing against. And my dad being the coach, very disciplined, said, guys, no penalties. Let's win the game, win the game. Well, with five minutes left, we were up five to two or so. I got a tap on the shoulder. He said, Kerry, go teach that big guy a lesson. Well, I went out and I fought this guy and he was, you know, I, I found it was easier to punch up than it is down. And um, at five foot uh, little and 115 pounds, yeah. I could fight better scared than he could mad. <laughs> I um, I speed bagged him pretty good. I cut him over both eyes. I was a lefty. I had bony hands and, and they cut. Him. And uh, so we got thrown out of the game. I'm in the dressing room. Uh, our guys come in. We win the tournament. Everybody's happy. And I hear an argument out side the dressing room door it's my dad's voice all of a sudden he came in the door he locked it in the dressing room locked the dressing room door came over to me put his arm around me he said carrie i'm I'm really proud of the way you took care of that guy he needed a a lesson he was a bully he said while you took the son i don't think you can take his mother she's out there waiting for you to come out uh it was the mother that my dad was arguing with he said we got to get you out of here yeah i said okay 
Uh, he said, you see that stick bag? I need you to get in the stick bag when you're dressed. He threw me over his shoulder in the stick bag and carried me out past the mother as she was looking at all the faces of my teammates trying to find that little guy that fought her son. You know what? It's so funny to hear these stories because the intensity that happens in small town hockey rinks is unmatched. And like that, so that was actually something I was going to ask you about later on, but I'll ask you now, what is it about hockey that brings that out in people? I mean, you walk into that rink and, and you've got someone up in the rafters who's going to let you know how they think. Well, it's the passion. Feeling. Well, certainly it's the passion that we as Canadians and it's transferred universal now. It's worldwide. Yeah. Passion for the game. You know, in Europe, um, when I was over doing the uh, 96 World Cup and, and then, of course, the Olympics in Nagano, Japan, which I happened yes, to wear. I love the, the shirt. Uh, the shirt. This is the first time out of the package uh, in honor of you and, and your Asian uh, uh, <laughs> listeners. Um, but there's such intensity. The game is intense, especially in the in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, and And fans are invested in the game. There was a survey done by a psychologist one time, a study, and said that the average hockey fan goes over the line of being uh, clinically defined as insane for one second of every hockey game. Um, wow, that's a great stat. Yeah, I mean, it's wild. That's um, wild, yeah. And certainly um, the, the referee is uh, a good target um, for excuse makers and uh, uh, for losses. You know, I did 12 Stanley Cup finals. Uh, I never won any, but I've been accused of losing 12. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's always three sides to the story, right? <laughs> True. That <laughs> so, brings up an interesting point. You, yeah. you just hit a nail on the head because yeah. um, I tried to create relationships. Uh, yeah. th that's the success of anyone in business. Mm -hmm. And I wanted players to play on my terms without me having to lay the hammer down and be a jerk be the tough guy. I had the power. I had the authority. I had the rule book. I had the whistle and I had the arm dance. I was the boss, yeah. but I wanted them to, I want, first of all, be approachable. Um, and I wanted to be able to communicate with them, develop relationships. And Rick Tockett was the young captain of the Philadelphia Flyers. And Rick was getting all kinds of misconduct penalties. He could fight. He could, he's a power forward. He was a great leader. His players respected him, but he was very emotional and he was getting all kinds of misconduct penalties. And in the Philadelphia Spectrum one game, talk came over to me and he's yelling and screaming like he normally would. And I put my hands up like this and I went, Rick, calm down. That means peace. Whoa, take a breath. Mm -hmm. I said, I'd love to have a conversation with you, but you have to calm down. And in that brief conversation with him, I wanted to let him know, one, that he could ask me a question if he did it respectfully. Mm -hmm. And also, I said, Rick, listen, you're a great player, great young captain uh, for the Philadelphia Flyers. You've got energy. You've got passion for the game. You're a leader. You can score. You can fight. You can do it all. But you can't do it from that penalty box that you're spending way too much time in. I would like to answer your question anytime, but you got to calm down, yeah. be respectful. I could see the light go on and, and it was almost like, you know, this guy's making sense. And to your point, I said, you only have to play against that team with the other jerseys on. Don't play against two teams, the stripes included, yeah. because you won't be successful at it. Mm -hmm. And and to that point, to your point, um, there's three teams on the ice, but the competitor should only play against the other team and not get so wrapped up in the official. Well, yeah, that's the toughest part of being an official. I mean, um, you know, uh, we'll get into your book in a few minutes, but uh, before we do, um, you played up to a pretty high level. I mean, you were captain of the, in, in the junior hockey league in Ontario, uh, obviously a very good hockey player, but there came a point where you thought differently about the game and you decided to move into the world of refing. Um, talk to me a little bit about that decision and, and what led to it. Well, certainly, uh, you know, I, I finished up at the junior A level in Sarnia and I, I was the captain of the team and, and, uh, I knew that I wasn't, I, I was undrafted that year. Um, I wasn't going to make it to the NHL. Uh, I had to accept reality. And I think you have to be honest with your, your assessment of yourself in anything that you do. Uh, and that really, that statement that I just made led to my success. 
uh, as a referee in the National Hockey League. But I, I had a whole bunch of U.S. scholarship offers, Division I schools. Um, I wasn't so inclined at that time. And uh, it might have helped me write another book if I had of uh, gone to the colleges, but uh, I did pretty well with the one that I wrote. In any event, um, I went to a referee school on a lark. I thought, you know what, why not? I'll give it a shot. A friend of my dad's who played pro with him was coaching in the International League at the time and went on to coach the Detroit Red Wings, Ted Garvin. He saw me play from the time I was little. And uh, he said, listen, you're a good little player. You play big, you play tough. Um, You're not going to make the NHL. You can play in our league and you can probably play in the American League, but you're not going to last. Why don't you get into officiating? The game needs former players that understand the game, understand the the uh, emotions of coaches and players and the nuances of the game. Uh, you're a great skater. Give it a shot. So I went to referee school. He handed me a brochure. I went up to Halliburton, north of Toronto, uh, to uh, a referee school that was conducted by uh, – NHL officials and at that time the WHA World Hockey Association was coming into being and uh, there were uh, members of that league there uh, instructing as well. It was a five-day camp at the fourth day I refereed in the evening a 10-minute stint uh, to be supervised Um, and uh, it was a men's intermediate league. Uh, I really didn't know what I was doing uh, as an official but I was uh, very coachable uh, and I really paid attention and learned a lot that week. Uh, after my 10-minute stint, uh, Assistant Director of Officiating, Mr. Frank Udvery, Hall of Fame uh, mm-hmm. referee, uh, approached me in the dressing room and said, introduced himself, said he really liked what he saw from me on the ice, and he would like to invite me to the NHL training camp for officials, which was going to take place three days later. Wow. Uh, I got a call from Mr. Udvery uh, when I got home from Halliburton, on the early Saturday morning and said, I've got space for you. Um, Last minute addition. And uh, I had to report the next day, Sunday for a 10 day uh, training camp with all the regular uh, NHL officials and linesmen. I was then put in the American hockey league uh, as a linesman that season uh, to gain some experience and to watch the other referees, how they did things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because players that I had played against the previous year were playing in the, uh, American Hockey League at the time. John Van Boxmeer was a first round pick of uh, of the Montreal Canadiens. He was mm-hmm. playing in Halifax for the Voyagers in the American League. So I had familiarity with players, uh, but I really uh, paid attention to this new trade. Uh, I put the stick and the gloves in the closet, mm-hmm. and I was now all focused on trying to be uh, an NHL referee. The next year, I was signed to a contract mm-hmm. as a minor league uh, referee and started my trade uh, learning, uh, certainly learning on the job uh, with some wild times in the early 1970s, uh, the way hockey was being played at that time. Um, And, you know, things happen. If they're going to happen, the crazy things that would happen are going to happen in the lower leagues, Mm -hmm. certainly the minor professionals. And uh, the higher up you go, the easier tends to be to officiate Mm -hmm. because the players are more skilled. You know what they're going to do. You can anticipate, but boy, oh boy, there was some great learning experiences that I had in the minor leagues. I'm sure. And I mean, with the first thing you said, there was um, basically, you know, you got thrown and thrown to the wolves. How much experience did you have before you got invited to that camp? Very little. I, uh, I used to referee just to get extra ice time with my dad in, in uh, men's uh, industrial leagues and things yeah. of that sort. I was pretty much a puck dropper. I'd chase the puck and, and get out there and get some extra skating uh, yeah. because uh, I was, uh, you know, so focused on being a player. Yeah. Um, and uh, I developed, I guess, an aptitude uh, during that period. Uh, one of the things in the, uh, in the early going uh, that I learned and, and served me best was I learned about myself. I learned about the things that I had acquired from the the tomb all the, the, the womb to you know playing in schoolyards, uh, uh, playing the game as a as a little player, developing a toughness uh, during uh, which was a very intimidating time within the game. Uh, but I learned I had to change, and I learned that the things that were su- created success for me as a player and respect were going to cause me to fail as a, as a referee. Uh, I had to change. I had to 
recognize the little man syndrome that I had, Mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to be pushed around just like that guy I had to teach a lesson to. Mm -hmm. Uh, I now had to uh, recognize that when I was in a confrontation with a player, and there were many of them in that, in that time, that from the pit of my stomach, it would roll up and boil and I was not going to be pushed around. And I became part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution with my attitude. Right. It was a great lesson. And I learned it with Wayne Gretzky, yeah. uh, more so in the very first time we met. Well, I mean, I love how candid and honest you are about this because I've gone through it myself and I know that most officials do. And if you're someone who's a student of the game and someone who has integrity and, you know, would never put themselves or anyone else above the game, you still have to learn all those little things. Like no matter how much you love and appreciate the game, there's so many little lessons. And Carrie, this book, I mean, reading through this book, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, The Final Call, if you're a hockey fan, it's a must read. Um, some of the stories in here are just, it's like, it's either something you've seen, something you've been through yourself, and then it just your perspective on it is so honest and so um, appealing to to a hockey fan like myself. And I'll tell you a funny story, Carrie, when I found out uh, that you were going to be on the podcast, thanks to um, my good friend, Andy Zombathy, who worked for us last year, he used to be a sound editor. He ran into you in Saskatchewan. Uh, you were going to do a presentation at a hotel, I believe. And he told me, uh, do you happen to know a guy named Kerry Frazier? I'm like, uh, yeah, of course I know Kerry Frazier. Because <laughs> Andy, God love him, didn't, didn't know anything about, uh, about hockey. So he was always learning new stuff, asking a lot of questions. Anyway, he calls me, tells me he meets you. Here we are talking. So I get the book. So I go on Amazon to buy the book. I ended up buying two by accident. I don't even know how I did it <laughs> to this day. I don't know how it happened. But the first one I bought was a used book. And it's inscribed on the inside to Matt. Enjoy the journey with me from between the lines. In friendship, Carrie Frazier. So I ended up with someone else's copy of the book, which was funny. pretty funny. And then a couple, and I was so disappointed. I was like, oh my God, I bought a used book. I didn't even notice. And then like two days later, uh, the doorbell rings and I got another copy. And it was it was a new copy that hadn't been touched. So, Well, Chris, that just shows... That. It- that just shows you it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> and it certainly does. So hockey fans, get this book, get it in front of your face and read it because there's so many great stories in there. Um, before we get into the details of the book, Carrie, what was the process like for you? I mean, uh, what's it like to write a book? Oh, my God. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, Chris. I yeah. had uh, always wanted to uh, write a book of memoirs. And it was spawned from I'm approachable after games. I, I, I love people. I love the game of hockey. Mm-hmm. And I would walk into a restaurant or a bar after a game, usually frequented by uh, the other team and, and hockey fans. And I would see people as soon as I walked in. I always sat with my back to the wall in just yep. in case. But uh, I would see people talking. Oh, there he is. Blah, 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 scowls. And, and I would get up and I'd walk over to a group of people that were obviously talking about me. And I'd extend my hand and shake it, uh, introduce myself and say, do you have a question for me? And, you know, the first one might have been a little aggressive. Yeah, I got a question for you. You missed that call. I'd explain it. And my adage on the ice, Chris, was to treat disrespect with respect. Mm -hmm. So I extended myself to them. I answered their question. I said, after that, do you have another question? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And it was a slow, a softer. Mm -hmm. That time you were talking to Glenn Sather or Gretzky or Mark Messier, uh, any of the players, what was it you guys were talking about? And I recognized in that moment that their ticket would only get them the best seat they could possibly get was at the glass on the other side. They wanted on my side of the ice they wanted to know what went on. And I thought, you know what? Um, a book, uh, writing, uh, sharing my career, sharing the stories from behind the scenes was really the way to connect with the fans. Yeah. So I had negotiated in my final, my very first game in Toronto, as a matter of fact. I met with a publisher, um, Jordan Fenn. They published the most hockey books of anybody in the world at the time. Mm-hmm. And I sat down with him. And we had a discussion. 
and I shared stories and I shared my vision as to what I wanted to do. I didn't have a, a sample chapter. I didn't have an outline written to hand him a proposal. I just talked and told him what my vision was. Yeah. At the end of it, he said, I want your book. So we negotiated a, uh, an advance. Um, it was going to be released in the fall of 2010 after my final season. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, I got busy that year. It was like the rock and chair circuit. I was saying goodbye to all my friends. We had injuries. It was busy year. And I never sat down to do, um, to do any writing uh, during the season. I finished my last game. I did. uh, It was an amazing final finish for me uh, with the most important game of the, uh, of the year uh, for the Philadelphia Flyers and New York Rangers that were tied for that very last playoff spot yeah. in the Eastern Conference. Uh, whichever team won was going into the playoffs. The other team was done, and it ended up in a shootout. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I did two days of, of sort of uh, media interviews and such, and then I sat down to write the book. I had picked out the, the picture that you see on the cover, and um, my wife and I, and I had a working title, The Final Call. And my wife came to me and said, I just saw your book on Amazon. It's for sale for fall release. I hadn't started writing it yet. Oh my gosh. I wrote that book in two and a half months, cover to cover. And then I had to get releases for the pictures I was using, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And literally I wrote around the clock and my, I used to, I'd, I'd take different locations in, in our home uh, with my laptop uh, to try and be fresh. And um, one of them really, to me, the most gripping chapters is the one with Theo Fleury and Tyson Nash. Yeah. I wasn't even going to put that, ty- uh, that chapter in the book until my brother called me from Sarnia and said, Theo had released his book, Playing With Fire. Um, very dark. Yeah. And I can understand why he was the way he was on the ice with me. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, my brother said, what did you ever do to Theo Fleury? I said, well, you know, he was, we had some, differences yeah uh, but i but i helped him out over t- you know in, yeah. in certain situations and he said man he really really trashed you in his book you're the only ref he really trashed so i got that and i read some of the stuff and i my objective too chris yeah. you as a referee yeah. you want to take a bad situation and you want to make it right mm-hmm. if that's your objective you're going to win more than you lose yeah um, and you're going to have a positive effect on the game that we love yeah so with that m- mindset, I knew there was a situation that I wanted to share uh, that Theo didn't bring up in his book. He just brought up the the, the attack he made on me yep. in uh, the uh, 1996 Stanley Cup playoffs in a game in Chicago. He was playing for the Calgary Flames. And he literally cursed at me like you can't believe, and he challenged me to a fight out in the parking lot, yep. took his helmet off, threw it at me. It yes. hit my skate. And I ejected him from the game. Uh, four years later, we're in Madison Square Garden, and there was a, an amazing situation. Theo had signed a one-year uh, uh, contract, a free agency contract, $8 million bucks with the New York Rangers, and was put in the uh, uh, substance abuse program by the league. He didn't start the season. Yeah. And so I won't tell the rest of the story, but it is amazing what transpired with Tyson Nash a second year pro and Theo Fleury and well feel how, free to tell the story I mean it's a it's one of the best parts of the book well if you don't it, want to spoil you. it okay it's well, up then to I'll, you I, I I was doing it as a teaser make sure everybody buys that book but anyway <laughs> here's what happened Theo Fleury that same guy that took his helmet off threw it at me cursed at me challenged me to a fight in in uh, four years earlier came to me at the end of the first period where we had a scrum just previously in the corner with all the players on the ice and Theo said to me Kerry don't let him talk to me like that I'm trying to clean my life up honest I haven't done drugs in x number of months I haven't had anything to drink I'm trying to clean my life up don't let him talk to me that way I said who what he told me now I had a decision to make I could have said human nature you know what remember all the times you cursed at me and you threw your helmet at me you challenged me to a fight what I saw before me was a wounded individual I saw and we have seven children and it was like one of my kids standing there in front of me that was in pain and I wanted to take his pain away and I said Theo if I can get Tyson Nash back here who was a second year pro 
with the St. Louis Blues and a trash talker and drawing penalties. He was a diver. And I said, if I can get Tyson back here at the start of this next period, and if he gives you a sincere apology, will you accept it like a man? He said, I will. My parting to, uh, shot to him was, if I get him here, promise you won't break a stick over his head. He said, I promise. I went right into the coach's room in Madison Square Garden, which you're seeing behind me now. Mm-hmm. And I talked to Joel Quinville, the coach, told him what Tyson Nash said to Theo. Joel rolled his eyes. He said, you want me to tell Tyson to take his gear off? He thought I was going to eject him from the game. Yeah. I said, no. How about we get Tyson to give a sincere apology to Theo? It would probably be good for Theo, and it might not hurt your guy either. He said, great idea. And he ran out of the dressing room into uh, the coach's room, into uh, the, the St. Louis Blues dressing room. While I'm standing with Theo Fleury on the red line between the two benches, Madison Square Garden, and out came the St. Louis Blues out of the Zamboni end. And Tyson looks like he's doing a skate by. I flag him over. I said, Tyson, come here. I said, do you have something to say to this man? Tyson Nash's lip was quivering. He was affected by this. He looked Theo straight in the eye. And he said, Theo, I'm sincerely sorry for the, the comments I made. I went way below the line, and I apologize. And he said, I wish you all the best in everything that you have ahead of you. And he tapped him on the shin pad. I said, wow. you good with that, Theo? He said, yeah, I'm good with that. I said, boys, shake hands. Let's play. Yeah. Now, I think that's the end of it. It's a handshake. It's an apology. That's all. Move yeah. on. Tyson did his job. He drew a guy into a fight. Got uh, New York got extra penalty minutes. They, St. Louis wins the game. So 10 years later, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, I'm writing the book and I call yeah. Tyson Nash because I want to put this good part of the story in it. And I said, Tyson, do you remember the situation with Theo Fleury in, uh, on December 20th of 2000 uh, at Madison Square Garden? He said, phone went dead quiet. He said, Carrie. That was a life-altering situation. It was career-changing. I said, talk to me. I got Tyson Nash to write in his own words that situation and what it meant to him. We were talking 10 years later. I have run into people. I do corporate speaking and and such. Uh, I do uh, alumni uh, charity events with uh, with players. I have heard that story retold and retold and retold because – Theo and Tyson still talk about it. And here's, here's the moral of the story, people. That was nothing more than soliciting an apology from my end. It was nothing. No big deal. But look at the, look at the legs and the mileage that it got. It changed by Tyson Nash's own admission. It changed the way he played, the way he approached the game. And in his own words in this book, I think it's really, really powerful. Oh, it's certainly heartwarming coming from you. Like, and as a teacher myself, and as a as a referee, like those moments are so so important. And and your evolution as a communicator, obviously, it you really evolved uh, in how you communicated with players throughout your career. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But this must have been, you know, it's one of your most proudest moments when you look back at it. Well, I think so. And and there were others. Uh, yeah. You know, there were times as a referee. Yeah. Um, we have a rule book. Um, you know, we we have to abide and apply the rules in a common sense sort of way. Keep the game entertaining. Keep it flow, but keep it safe first of all. And that's the primary uh, reason that we have those sorts of rules. And they've evolved over time as a result of situations that occurred uh, in the history of our game. Um, but there were times where I felt that I needed to be beyond the referee, the morality police. Yeah. I think that. There were certain things that were acceptable um, and there were things that weren't that went below the line. Yeah, they weren't in the rule book per se, but there was a moral compass and a moral code uh, that I felt needed to be adhered to uh, from for respect of the game uh, and for opponents. Uh, I didn't like the trash talk, especially uh, when it um, involved uh, players, families. And I jumped in on a few occasions uh, when that did happen, even well, with that, fans, of course. even with fans, yeah. I had, I threw a fan out of a game in, uh, in Washington in the cap center, the old Washington cap center in Landover, Maryland in about 1982 mm-hmm. in an afternoon game. And they didn't get a lot of fans back then. They didn't have much of a good team. <laughs> and it was a Saturday afternoon game and we had a stoppage of play. And I heard this foul mouth guy, Southern drawl, 
And I looked and here's this big, heavy guy with flannel red shirt on and, and coveralls and a beard. Yeah. He looked like man, man from the mountain. Yeah. And he was cussing like you can't believe. And there were all kinds of families, young kids around him. Mm-hmm. I, again, jumped in. I went to the timekeeper at the stoppage of play. And I said, I want you to get security. And I want that guy out of this building. Mm-hmm. I don't, we're not dropping the puck until he's gone. Yeah. The guy said, yeah, okay. I said, no, no, you're not understanding me. This game is not going to continue until that man is out in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. So he's on the phone. He calls down big five, big <clears throat> security people came down. They tap this guy in the shoulder. Come on, let's go. They help him up. They escort him out. And the whole section of fans with their families were applauding this yeah. guy leaving. I mean, some of the situations we get dealt with uh, or we get dealt as officials are people won't even believe half of the stories that, you know, we could share. But obviously yours um, at a much higher level than I've ever experienced, but throwing, throwing people out of rinks and, and you know, having to deal with those, those kind of things takes a lot of courage. Um, it takes a lot of mental fortitude and strength to be able to do those things. And it's, you know, those lessons that make us who we are. Um, so just to get back to the book, uh, it starts off with a forward from Gretzky. So, I mean, immediately hooked. Um, I just want to give you a few of the quotes from the book and, you know, get your thoughts on some of them. And one of the first ones that stood out to me was we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And you talked about having little man syndrome and, and, you know, that fine line that we have to go through for being cocky or arrogant to being confident and courageous. Um, talk to me a little bit about that quote and what that meant to you. Well, when I went to the NHL training camp uh, for officials, I was 19 years old, just turned 20. Yeah. Um, no experience as an official. I'm infused with all of these guys that I see have seen on TV refereeing games. And, and I, as a, as a player, I recognize that being a rookie, you can learn a heck of a lot more by listening and not talking. Mm -hmm. So the two ears came into play and I would sit in, in rule sessions and such. I might ask a question to a veteran that was near me. Um, Funny story, Lloyd Gilmore, who refereed the Russia uh, Philadelphia Flyer game uh, that the Russians left the ice. The, yeah. the Broad Street bullies were just mm-hmm. clubbing them to death. <laughs> um, and uh, they were coaxed to come back by uh, Alan Eagleson, who said, uh, you're not going to get your money unless you finish this game. Uh, they finished the game. Lloyd Gilmore didn't call a whole lot of penalties. Um, and th- back then, we were going through the rule book every day. And we'd do a number of rules, and Scotty Morrison was the referee in chief. And and we'd, he'd read the rule and we'd have a discussion about it. And there was a, a rule for spearing back then. It said you could either, based on the uh, judgment of the referee, you could assess a two-minute spearing penalty or a five-minute penalty for spearing. And I said to uh, Lloyd Gilmore, I was sitting beside him, and I said, Mr. Gilmore, what's the difference between a two-minute spearing penalty and a five-minute spearing penalty? Lloyd said, well, kid, if you see the stick go in, it's two minutes. If you see it come out the back of his shirt, it's five minutes. <laughs> that was the mentality back then, the sort of let them play kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, but it was really uh, a wonderful experience. Um, again, listening and being around those guys uh, that they were surveying me as much as I was trying to learn from them. And after three or four days, um, I was invited to be part of the inner circle. Um, and, uh, you know, that, you know, they decided that this young kid is, is going to be okay. And, uh, they'd like to help me out. And they certainly did. Um, I learned an awful lot from referees like Dave Newell, yeah. Art Scove, number one at the time, Art Scove, and, uh, all the rest of those guys. Well, you mentioned earlier about having to, you know, the importance of knowing the game or being a former player, somebody who's, that's, I think, where a lot of the confidence comes that you need to have as a referee. Um, And for you, I mean, it seems like that's exactly what it was. You know, you had that experience, you had that, that ability to hold yourself accountable for what you were seeing on the ice. Well, you know, I think one of the most important things for an official, every game has a temperature. Mm -hmm. No two games are alike. 
you can learn a lot and become experienced in handling situations that are similar, but each one in each game is unique. And so having uh, the feel for the game, having that litmus test that you let the players play to the edge, and that's the most entertaining and exciting part of our game, not over-controlled, but kept in control where it's right at the edge. Uh, controlled mayhem, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you have to have that feel as a referee. You have to you have to know when it's time to let the horse run, and it's, you have to know when it's time to pull the reins in. And the successful referee will do that. Communication is key. Yeah. And there were times where I found that um, once I established myself, and coaches and players knew that if I said something, I meant it. I never threatened a player. I never said, you do that one more time and you're going to get it. I would choose my words very carefully because if you, if you made that statement and you didn't follow through, you'd have no credibility. That's right. So I would utilize uh, the, the relationship with maybe a captain that I had. And I would go to him and say, listen, you guys are taking way too much uh, liberty of my generosity here. I need you to yeah. control it because if you don't, I'm going to have to start. Yeah. I'd go to coaches when we had scrums, especially in the playoffs. Guys were snowing the goalies, and that became an issue one year in the in the playoffs. And scrums were ensuing. I would go to both coaches, and I'd say the same message to each guy. I'd say, listen, I've had enough of this uh, scrumming and snowing of the goalie. If it happens again, I will call a penalty. It might be your guy, or it might be their guy. But I'm not going to do the old even up, you know, a minor to each guy. It's going to be one penalty to one player of one team. Yeah. So either you control it or I will. And once you've communicated have, that, it's now it's the ball's in their court. I immediately heard Chris, the, the coaches say to the all the way down the bench. OK, yeah. boys, you heard him. Yeah. So, I mean, and what you're saying is, you know, one of the very first lessons I learned um, Going to like, a, I was invited to a, like a performance camp in Halifax and uh, officially officiating camp. And our guest speaker was NHL linesman Matt McPherson. And Matt wasn't in the NHL at the time, he was refing junior hockey. Um, and I knew as a former player and as a coach at the time, like how important communication was. Any professional team, any professional sporting event you go to, you can hear the players. It's it's constant. But what I didn't realize was how much communication was going on between the officials and the players, the officials and the coaches, the officials and the goalies. I mean, just the just know the players need to know that you're engaged. They need to know that you are there for them. You're complimenting them on a nice goal they just scored or a nice save that's made. They just need to know that you care. And I mean, is it similar for you, like even at that highest level? Because I mean, I'm roughing a game here on a Saturday night. It's 10 o'clock. Sometimes you're not the most engaged, but you always have to be aware of the fact that those players are there. They're there to enjoy the game. It's your job to make it fun, fun and safe for them and just engage, engage yourself in that moment. Well, two points, uh, Chris, to that. Uh, First of all, uh, self-deprecating humor, Mm -hmm. uh, enjoying the game as a, like I loved doing what I did. I loved the game and I love being able to perhaps have a positive effect, not an influence, uh, but a a positive effect on the the overall game and the way it's played uh, with the player safety and and, uh, with the puck movement, keep it moving, uh, of uh, talking to players to avoid having to call penalties. Uh, But the self-deprecation, I I learned very quickly uh, with that chip on the shoulder, little man syndrome. And I was working in the minor leagues and the home team was just getting spanked big time in one game. And and every time a goal was scored against some fans that litter the ice players would frustration would come to me and mouth off. And I bang them with the misconduct. Yeah. I had them sitting like three deep in the penalty box at the, uh, at, towards the end of the third period. And finally the coach of the home team, he was frustrated. He had enough of me too. And he sent his captain over after a goal and more litter on the ice and another guy in the penalty box. And, uh, the captain said, Mr. Referee, my coach wants to know if he can get a penalty for thinking. I said, well, <laughs> if he doesn't think out loud, he's yeah. probably going to be okay. He said, well, in that case, he thinks you're an effing asshole. <laughs> well, 
I looked over at the coach who had one foot up on the bench and he's scowling. And I, I started to smile and laugh and not out of disrespect for what the guy said, but I just found it was a great con. It was funny. Yeah. And so I looked over at the coaches as I was smiling and laughing and he cracked a smile and then he started to laugh. And, and I went good on you, man. Yeah. Like it taught me in that moment, something about myself that I needed to do. I needed to relax more. I needed to smile. I needed to enjoy the game. Mm-hmm. I didn't need to be an asshole. Yeah. Like there's a way to, to get players to play on your terms without being that guy. Yeah. And the communication it, is, good I mean, the amount of penalties that you, that don't happen through good communication, it's astronomical guys skating around the, the net being chased by someone. You, you just yell, no stick, no stick. He's not going to hook him. Right. He knows you're there. He knows you're watching. Right. You just avoided a penalty sure. and a power play and a whole cut bunch of different problems. Um, yeah. So let's get to the next quote, Carrie, because this one's a beauty. I really laughed when I read this. Pre-existing conditions only apply to health insurance. Now, this quote for me <laughs> is so important because you have to be able to have a clean slate. You, you, of course, you can understand players and situations, but holding grudges, um, holding things over players' heads, things like that have to be avoided at all costs. Where did that uh, quote come from? And I believe it was in the chapter about Mario and Sid that you were talking about that. Well, you know, not all relationships that you develop are fruitful and positive. Yeah. There are some that you just, the, the we just don't mesh, we don't mix. Uh and even in those kinds of relationships or fractured relationships, you as an official have to be the bigger person. You cannot hold a grudge. You cannot preconceive uh, or I'm going to get this guy tonight. I'm going to stick it to him. You have to be above that. And you know what? We're, we're talking about fighting human nature sometimes mm-hmm. because we don't like everybody. We, it, it's a competitive game. It's an aggressive game. Uh, we're, we're pitted in a battle sometimes. How we handle that, how we control our own natural instinct of fight versus flight or calm versus I'm going to tell you something. Mm-hmm. Body language even is so important as I, as I looked at myself on the screen. If I give you that, I mean, that's offensive. That can throw gas on a fire. Yeah. Whereas, whoa, you know, calm. So there were times and and with Mario, man, oh man, I, I had a bad night one time, uh, not so much in what I was doing in the game, but with what I said to Mario Lemieux, great player, amazing skill. Uh, he was frustrated. Um, he didn't like to be touched. Uh, he was very instrumental in actually the way that the game is played uh, today uh, without the hooking and the holding and, yeah. and such. Uh, people do come to watch the skilled players uh, as much as certain marketplace like to see fights. Um, but nonetheless, I had, uh, I had a night that I regret where I dressed him down uh, on the ice. And, uh, you know, it, uh, I think it, it damaged uh, the relationship with Mario uh, throughout our career somewhat. I have the utmost respect for him as a player. Yeah. Uh, and once the, once the words come out of your mouth, you can't pull them back. I know. You can't suck them back. Yeah. And, uh, but there's also, uh, times when, uh, I had to apologize. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's really crucial. Uh, if you make a mistake or with the Gretzky situation, uh, the first time I met him, And he took a dive the very first shift and I stuck it to him. I didn't, I didn't do my job that night uh, because we didn't have a diving penalty and I was going to show him, you know, play my way or you're not going to get the call. Um, And ultimately I won the battle that night, but I knew that I would lose the war. And the very next time I saw Wayne, I apologized for my behavior in that game. And it was against Bobby Clark and the Philadelphia Flyers, yeah. the Broad Street Bullies, if you will. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's important uh, that integrity is a, is a word uh, that's not just a word. You have, to, you have to exercise integrity throughout every game that you work and, and throughout all the situations that you have to deal with uh, in the course of a game. And if you really try to make 
something positive happen out of something negative, if that's your objective, it's not always going to be possible. Yeah. But if you do that and you treat disrespect with respect as much as humanly possible, yeah. you're going to uh, you're going to have a positive influence on the game. Absolutely. And acknowledging when you do make mistakes. I mean, we're all humans. We all make them. It's so important, like you sure. said, just um, just to bring the human element back into it and realize, you know, everybody's got to realize we make mistakes. Could you imagine if you skated around the ice pointing out all the mistakes that happened with the players? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, you know, the, this, the skill of the players. Uh, and, the, and again, that would that would create a confrontation. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, for sure. Um, being the, being the one that has to, uh, certainly try and uh, bring the temperature down, you know, the very first time, uh, that I, uh, recall a positive effect of, uh, going to a bench to talk to a coach, because we were instructed, stay away from the bench. Don't go to the bench. Don't talk to the coaches. Uh, bad things can happen. Once you're there, you know, if you end up taking all their, their guff, you really can't bench them. Stay away. Well, Brian Murray was coaching the Washington Capitals, and he went on to be the coach and general manager of Ottawa. Yeah. Um, Brian was getting all kinds of bench penalties uh, in uh, the early 80s uh, with Washington when he was coaching there. And this one particular night in, in the Cap Center, he was up on the bench. He was screaming and yelling and flapping his arms and at a stoppage of play. And I thought, you know, bench penalties really aren't working for this guy. I want to go to that bench. And I want to try and have a communication, a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. So I went to the bench and Brian was literally one foot up on the, on the dasher boards, up on the bench. And he's screaming and yelling. And I opened palms. I went, Brian, I need you to calm down. I'd love to have a conversation with you, but I need you to get off the bench and please calm down. Mm -hmm. And in that monotone voice, he immediately got down off the bench. Mm -hmm. I said, now you may not agree with what I have to tell you but this is the reason I did or didn't whatever the play was. And I explained it. He thought for a second, he looked up and he said, well, Kerry, you're right about one thing. I don't agree with what you said, but thanks for coming over to talk to me. Now in his post game press conference, Brian Murray, the coach said to the media, this is the first time that a referee came over to talk to me at the bench to give me an explanation. And while we agreed to disagree, I appreciate it the fact that he gave me an explanation. What took place from that, Chris, was a seed was planted for a relationship between Brian Murray and me, the referee, from that moment until we finished together in the league. Folks, that brings us to the end of part one of my interview with the great Kerry Frazier. Stay tuned for more fantastic stories. Part two will be coming out next week. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing sponsors, the China Hockey Group, Wheel Hub Asia, AccessoryHouseGlobal.com, Yardley Brothers Beer, and of course, Sunset Studio. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Across the Pond HK. Email us, send in your comments and questions to the show at any time at Across the Pond HK at gmail.com.